that we got it after we found somebody else. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and so I, we want to talk to you today about partnership. Now, here's what partnership is. Partnership is a lot of, and y'all give it up for my beautiful wife up here. She, I'm so excited to have her. She, she's way smarter than me, better looking than me. Uh, all that stuff, she, she's going to bring the fire. But a lot of partnership, and, and I know you'll agree, is about learning to see different perspectives, right? And so how many of you know that managing perspectives can be difficult because two people can see the same thing but see something completely different? right? You know what I'm saying? And so like if there's a cloud with a certain shape in the sky, you and somebody else can look at the same cloud. One see a lion and one see a horse. You know what I'm saying? And so you can see something completely different. Well, uh, we've been married 11 years on May 17th of this year, right? Now I got the date, baby. I did it. That'll get, that'll, that'll help me for 43 years, right? Praise God right there. May 17th will be 11 years. So 10 years ago, about nine and a half to 10 years ago, we bought our first house. Uh, it's the house we're still in, and uh, praise God. And, and we, we love it. And, and, and when we bought this house, right, it's a nice house, and it had a room over the garage, a finished room over the garage. It's called a frog. And it was sheetrocked. It was carpeted. It was, like, ready to go. Now, when I saw that room, most men in the room know exactly what I saw, right? I saw a pool table. I saw a big screen 70 inch flat screen tv with surround sound xbox and sports come on sir. Oh, 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 oh. you know what i'm saying like you know i had it up there i i was hunting and fishing at the time and uh although, although i've never killed a deer in my life i had stuffed deer on the wall yeah you were gonna hang up my daddy I was gonna, yeah i was gonna grab the one from her dad's house and hang it up and say yeah i killed that one on may I don't know. Anyway, and and stuff, I like, I had it right in my mind. I knew exactly what that thing was going to be, but I never verbalized it because sometimes you can verbalize verbalize things too soon and it goes out of whack. But how many of you know you can see the same thing and not see the same thing? (laughs) And so I saw that, but that ain't what she saw. No, not at all. Mm -mm. So (laughs) what I saw when I went up there was I knew that we were going to, be expecting probably you know within a year of being in that house so I was like well we don't need all these toys all in our den for us to trip over so we can just throw them all upstairs and have a nice playroom with a cool futon by the window and the sun beaming in and our kids just playing and a little tv you know on the um, little tvs are pointless little tv for some time There's still no point and out. then I saw it as like half a playroom and then half like a really modern office you know, with like a furry rug or something where I could grade my papers and, you know, I just thought. <laughs> so anyways, that's what I saw it as. But really, babe, what what did it It become? did not become either of those things. No, not at all. Okay, because marriage is a partnership, which that's means right. compromise, right. right? And so um, I had um, a, a gaming chair, an Xbox, and about a 32-inch TV. Uh, that's all I had. My wallet fell. Um, and, and that's all I had in that room for me. The rest was like really cute and pretty. And I'm like, that's not a man cave. It became not a she cave, not a man. It became a shan cave, a shan cave. And it was bad. And then about a year and a half later, year, year and a half later, we had our, our first child, Brody. And uh, how many of you know when you have children? Everything changes. Nothing is the same again. Nothing. I don't care what it is. You don't even go to the bathroom the same anymore. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, um, we, 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 everything changed. And so it became a playroom. So we had the nursery in our room, obviously. And then we had a guest room because we never had guests stay the night. But by God, we had a guest room. So we were ready if, for them. We were ready. If they just showed up, it we were like, there. we got an empty room for two years sitting here waiting on you. Uh, we had that, and we had a playroom upstairs, and so my man cave idea is still dormant, but there's going to come a day in the name of Jesus where there's going to be a seed sown, and I'm going to get my man cave. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but it became that because, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Uh, that's why you shouldn't let me drink energy drinks before we get started. Um, that's a joke. Um, and so, uh, but it became to where we really did compromise. We really yes. did say, what does this need to be for us? That's right, and like like you were saying marriage becomes when you get married it's a partnership it becomes less about me 
and more about we. Yeah, more about we. Even though I would joke, you know, what's yours is mine and what's mine is mine. Yes. That's not true. Nin, that is true. <laughs> Don't let them lie to you. That is true. Uh, no, um, and so uh, it, it becomes less about me and more about we. Yeah. But I want to I tell you, how many of you have heard this statement? Opposites what? Attract. Opposites attract. When you're dating, opposites attract. When you're married, opposites attack. It's just what happens, right? Because when you're dating, it's cute, right? And so I'll give you a quick story on that just really fast. Um, when, I was, when we were dating, I was living with my brother uh, for a couple years, which um, was a great thing for us. Um, but uh, my brother and I got it along like oil and water about half the time. The other half the time, we were great, right? And so I am not the most clean person in the world. Like, I'm just not that neat and tidy um, and so uh, she thought it was funny at the time. My brother is a clean freak. We got any clean freaks in the room? Anybody? Like, you just love things to be clean? Perfect. That's great. I'm, I really want the things to be tidy now. Um, I just don't want to have to do it. But anyway, and so in the moment, like, I lived with my brother. And, and I remember she came to the house one day uh, to visit and hang out. And uh, she walked in, and my brother was yelling at me. Now, that's not an abnormal thing, because if you know me and know my brother, my brother is more kind of straight-laced, and he's more serious. I am rarely ever serious, right? I just enjoy giving him a hard time and aggravating him. And so he's yelling at me, but here's what he's yelling at me about. And y'all are going to love this. Like, I had left a bowl of cereal by the sink, not in the sink, not in the dishwasher, by the sink. The problem was it had been sitting there over a week. Y'all don't act like you've never been in college before. What's wrong with y'all? Y'all judging me right now. The Lord said. Anyway, and so it was sitting there. And my brother liked to try to teach me lessons, right? And so he wanted to see how long it would sit there before I picked it up and cleaned it up, right? Well, I left it there long enough for this bowl of cereal and milk to become something that cereal and milk should never, ever become in its lifetime. And so I walk in, and she walks in at the perfect time where he's yelling at me. He's like, you're disgusting. You're me. And she's laughing. She's loving it because she's like, Brandon's getting on his nerves, and Eric's just tearing him up and all this stuff, right? But now we're married for uh, 11 years, and um, it's not funny anymore, <laughs> right? Opposites attract. It was funny then because it wasn't her. Now there's moments where um, opposites attack. And, and I walked from the back of the house not too long ago, about a month ago, right? And I heard Megan praying this prayer out loud, y'all, praying out loud as she was throwing something away. She said this. She said, Lord... Help him to get rid of all the trash in his life. And I'm like, I don't know what I did wrong, but praise God, she's, she's praying over me, right? And I walk in, and I see that she's throwing away two drink cans that were sitting on my TV tray next to my recliner. And she's, throw, she's throwing away my trash while praying that I would throw away trash in my life. And I said, what are you doing? And she goes, I've just gotten to the point where I don't nag you about it anymore. I just literally pick your stuff up and pray for you. And I was like, well, that's great. Because I need the prayer and you need the practice. So I'll just help you out. Man. Right? And, and, and that did not go over very well. But here's, the, here's why I say all that about differences. Is if we're not careful, the enemy will take a difference that's in our lives and he will divide us where God wants to take a difference and strengthen us. God wants to look at us and go, here's the thing. They are different than you. Men, I don't know if you know this or not. You're different than your wife. Wives, they're different than you, right? I heard something recently, and, and I know I'm kind of go off for, for a minute, but just hear me. I heard something recently that women's word count, like psychologically, their word count for the day is like 20,000. I'm not kidding you, like 20,000, right? Men's, guess what theirs is? 7,000. I'm serious, 2,000. 7,000. Here's the thing. Women will talk and talk and talk and talk, and that's not a bad thing. That's your word count, but you get mad. You'll get mad at me for not talking to you as much as I want to, but it's not because I'm trying to ignore you. It's because I've hit my cap. <laughs> and you're still trying to fulfill your quota, right? And, and it's just a different kind of thing. I might have the numbers off a little bit, but the different, there's a different kind of thing, and we've got to choose to get bitter about their difference or better from their difference, and it's our decision there. That's right. And God intends for our marriages to be blessed. And so I'm going to talk with you for just a minute about how God intends for our marriage to go. So let's read Matthew 19, 4 through 6. It says, 
Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. God, we pray right now, Lord, that you would just help us to use your words and your wisdom in our relationships. Help us live the life that you intend for us. Amen. Amen. So let's go. So today I want to submit to you for the fact that a marriage is a covenant, not a contract. And so let me tell you the difference in those two things. So a marriage that is, um, that is under contract, if you will, they're in you're in 50-50, and we know marriage should be 100-100. You should be committed and, and, and just all, you know, both all in. But a marriage un- under contract, you say, well, I'm only as far in as you're in, yeah. you know, and, and I'm only in this because we signed a paper, because if we wouldn't have signed the paper, you know, I'd be done. And that's why you're there, because you made that vow, and it's not because you are committed. And so I thought about... Um, I was a teacher for 10 years, and there's something that we, um, that we do called a, behavior, a behavioral contract. If a child is constantly um, like having this negative behavior, you can write up a contract that you and them sign, and it's an agreement that if you do this, then you get that. And a marriage that's under contract, you think of it that way. You're like, well, I'll rub your back if... You pray for me. You pray for me. You know, like, so that's not how a marriage is intended to be. It's I'm going to do this, that, and the other, and I'm going to love you till death, like I said um, on our wedding day, regardless of what you do or what comes up. Marriage is meant to be a covenant. Now, a covenant is when you're both all in. And you are going to do whatever it takes to make it work. You never walk away. You don't use the exit door. You know that you are bought in and that there ain't nothing going to separate you. Nothing. Nothing. No one. No other man. No other woman. Nothing. It says let no man separate what God has brought together. And so that's... um, the difference in a contract and a covenant. Yes, we agree that we're going to do A, B, and C, and we made our vows to each other, but the difference is a covenant is not meant to be broken. I think about um, the first mention of a covenant in the Bible. It's between God and Noah. And, you know, God promises all these things, and they, they are in agreement. But the thing that I love about their covenant is the fact that it's unconditional. And regardless of the fact that Noah fell after the flood and he messed up, God's covenant was never broken because, broken because nothing could separate what God had joined together and the agreements that he makes and the promises that he, he makes. Nothing can separate them. So um, one thing is, you know, just like that, covenant, the covenant that God made between him and Noah, that's how our marriage should be. And in Ephesians 5, 1, um, it says for us to be imitators of Christ. And if we're called to be like him, of course, that's like his son. And his son, nothing can separate us. I think about the covenant with us. Nothing can separate us. He loved us so much. God loved us so much that he sent his son. No matter what we have done, his covenant can't be broken with us. And that's how our marriages should be. It's so good that no matter what we've done, eternal life is still available to us. It's a covenant that never breaks. And I think what's important is that we put some parameters and guardrails around the word partnership and covenant and figure out what that looks like. And I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 27, which may be the most popular passage of scripture when it comes to relationships and marriages in churches. But I hear it abused and, and taken out of context so much. And I just want to take a few minutes and I want to give you out of this two things 
that are, is a covenant partnership in marriage. Two things, and it's, and it's these two things, godly leadership and mutual submission. And they're both scriptural. They're both right here in the next few verses. And I'm just telling you, if men, if we will learn what godly leadership is, then it will go far. And, and if we'll learn what mutual submission is, then it will go far. I want, I want to read these passages of scripture to you real quick. And I'm, I'm going to stop a little bit in between and, and give some anecdotes and thoughts. But uh, if you're with me, say yeah. yeah. I hope we're helping somebody today. Verse 21 says this, And be subject to one another. In the fear of Christ. Be subject to one another. Here's what we hear a lot of times is, wives, submit to your husbands. What he says before he ever gets to that passage of scripture is this, be subject or submissive to one another, to each other. In other words, she's no less important than I am. And I'm no less important than she is. We are to subject ourselves and submit ourselves to one another. And it says, in the fear of Christ. Can I sub submit this to you today? And it is this, that maybe the way that we treat our marriage is an indication of how we treat our relationships with Jesus. Think about that. If I have a hard time submitting to her love, I probably somewhere deep down in my spirit have a hard time submitting to his. In fear of Jesus, everything has to be Christ first. We are different. We've already joked about that and talked about that. We're different. And, and the thing is, a lot of times in my life, I'm so bullheaded, and I'm so driven, <coughs> and I'm so task-oriented, I miss a lot of things. Women, ladies, are so, you're, you're emotional be beings. You, you go by feelings. Like, I feel like. We, you don't hear men say that a whole lot. Like, I just feel like you're just distant. <laughs> Most men aren't going to say that. Some men do, and that's cool because I want to be like you. But most women are like, I just feel that this is going on. And what I've learned over a, the, almost 11 years of marriage is when she tells me she feels something, I need to shut up and listen. Because usually within a few months, it comes to pass. I feel like you don't need to be in this situation. I feel like you need to be careful of this. I feel like, and I'm like, nah, I'm good. And then in a couple months, it's like, oh, okay, you were right. I should listen to you because there's a feeling there. In the, but if I never submit in to one another in, in, in the fear of Christ if I never submit to one another I never listen to what she has to say and I may miss God trying to teach us something because I don't want to listen to her because she's less important to me unless I understand that so verse 21 says that and then let's go 22 through 27 it says wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord let me stop there for a minute to your own husbands don't look at the expectations of the bachelor on ABC and put them on your husband Listen, they need something different, obviously, because they got to find love on a TV show than your husband does. Don't put their needs on the man that sleeps in the same bed with you. Find out what he needs and what he wants and what he desires and make that happen for him. You know what I'm saying? Stop going, oh, I, he needs that because that's what, no, we're not all the same. We're all different. Men, we need to do the same thing. Know what our, women, our, our, our wives need, our ladies need, and give them that. Mutually subject yourselves to one another, right? Be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. That rubs some people the wrong way. Like, don't tell me that he's above me and he's better than me. No, no, no. Anything that is going to be successful has a structure. And there's always someone that's at the head of the structure. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a job. I don't care if it's a, if it's a team at Radiate. I don't care. There's always somebody at the head of the structure because somebody has to take the fall for what's happening, right? And that's just the case. And God says, it's not that he's better than you. It's just that he's called to be the head of the relationship. And sadly, some of you ladies out there are single moms that have had to be the head and the supporter. You've had to be the head and the supporter. And you, I commend you because I just believe that God has special blessing for that. But I also believe God has somebody that's a stronger leader than you ever thought possible that will come into your life and fill the void that somebody else left you with. Come on, somebody. And then it says, but as Christ is subject to the church, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. Listen to me. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to her, for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, 
that he might present to himself the church. Or you can say this because it's all conjunctive here. That he might present to himself the wife in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Men, listen, listen. If you want to know how to love your wife, I'm going to to make it real easy for you. You need to go read the gospel and know how Jesus loved the church. And I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about the church, our people. He died for the church. He looked and he said, everything you've ever done wrong in your life, I will take the blame for and I will die for it so that you can come to a place to where you are holy and blameless before the Lord. In other words, I will make you look so good and I will make myself look so bad. Because I love you so much. How should we love our wives? That's how we should love our lives. And we and, and I hear this sometimes. I wish she'd just honor me. Give her somebody to honor. Give her somebody to love. Give her a reason to honor your authority, not your dictatorship. It's not about telling her what to do. It's about loving her in the midst of it and leading with, with guidance and with vision and with direction. It's about doing those things. Men, listen to me. If we are going to love our wives as Christ loved the church, that means we got to become selfless and less prideful than we've ever been in our lives. And we got to go, her vision, her, what God's put in her life, her abilities and giftings are more important than anything that I could figure out. We are not to lord over our wives. We are not the lord of our wives. We are the guidance that God uses. And if I become a dictator, hey, you will do this and you will do that. Now we can stand up and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm just letting you know that. We're going to pray before meals. We're going to eat together. We're going to pray together. We're going to love together. We're going to love hard. We're going to serve hard. All those things, right? All those things are great. But I can't look at her and dictate her life and then expect her to honor me as as, as a leader. Because that's not a leader. That's not a leader. That's a dictator. Now, I want you for just a couple minutes, because I know what we got coming up in just a minute, something really special. But I want you for just like two minutes to break down what this means to you in the honor uh, of Christ. So um, just to the ladies, when you are to submit to your husband, that does not mean that you're weak. Now, I will preface everything that I'm about to say to let you know I have not. I've never done everything right. This is speaking to me so much. Like God has just revealed so much to me in our marriage, um, just through studying for today. And something that I always think about, because in the beginning of our marriage, I really struggled with, you know, wanting things the way I saw them and trying to control the way everything went instead of making it about we, it was about me because I thought that my way was the way and the only way, and it's not, obviously. Um, but First Peter 3, 4, it talks about wives, and it says that we are to have a gentle, quiet spirit, and that, that pleases God. And when I read that, I was like, man, like, my words to you are not always um, very gent- gentle. And, you know, that's okay, because we're not perfect. But I just used to nag him and make the whole household because you know when mama's not happy nobody's happy and that is praise that the is, lord that's real true because i mean women we have a way we're like we are the thermostat and it can get hot real quick and the whole house is sweating because they're like what's she gonna do what is about to happen but i i realized that my god is not pleased when i act like that when i don't get what i want so even if you have to when you want to get mad in your relationship Think about what it's going to lead to. How, what, is, what, what temperature are you about to set around you? And you have to say, all right, Megan told me I need to have a gentle, quiet spirit with you. So I'm not going to yell at you. I'm going to walk away and I'm going to think about it and, you know, use God's words. So we don't always do that, but I promise you after a while it gets easier to show that you have a gentle, quiet spirit. But here's what we were designed for, women. So in the beginning, in Genesis 2, 18, it says that men, or the man, he, he wasn't meant to be alone. And so God made a helpmate that was just fit, that was suitable. Think about that. Like, if I gave you an extra, extra large, like, it wouldn't fit right god has made you specifically fit for another for for the man and and he said that we are to be a helpmate 
And so I think about a couple verses later where it says, okay, so, so he's not alone. I'm going to make a woman out of man. I'm going to pull the rib from the side. And y'all go with me here. I think that God chose a rib from the side because we are meant to come alongside our husbands. And we're supposed to support him and whatever God has called him to do. God said, I'm going to create a helpmate, Megan. Don't be a hurt mate to him. And so many of us are just hurting our husbands. And I thought about this this morning. Colossians 3, 20, 23 says, whatever you do, work at it as if it is for the Lord. And when I go now to say things that are so hurtful to him, I say, wow, would I do this to the Lord because he's here? You know, we often use that on our kids like we do Santa Claus and and things like that. We're like, God's watching. Even if mama's not there, Brody, you know God is watching you. But God's watching me too. And God's not pleased when my spirit is not gentle and quiet. And I'm not slow to speak and slow to become angry. God designed us women to be a helpmate. And again, one thing that really attracted me to him was I knew what he was called to do. He was called to grow, to equip, and to empower leaders, to change this world for Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you what, knowing that attracted me to him. Did he have it all together? Did his assignments change? No, he didn't have it all together. And yes, his assignments changed, but he knew deep down what what he was walking in the purpose that God set before him and before him and he didn't stop nothing stopped him so listen if you're single listen for a second know what the person you're with your boyfriend your girlfriend know what they're for and know what they're chasing because do you want to get lost with them because if they don't know where they're going how can you help them Let them find. Y'all listen. Listen to this. A lot of times we look in a man for him to complete us. And he is meant to compliment us. God is our completer. And we're searching. As singles, you're searching for completion in your life. You've got this God-shaped hole in you and you're trying to fill it with a man. And you're like, all I need, God, that's all I need. All I need is a relationship and I'll be complete. And this is kind of funny, but it popped in my head and I don't even know if it's a good movie. But Jerry Maguire, it was just the sweetest part of the movie. And he's like, you complete me. Y'all, that is a lie. No one can complete you but God. No one. So let's treat if we're not there yet and we're looking for somebody, take that energy and pursue God. Instead of getting lost in someone who doesn't even know what they want or where they're going, get lost in the Father who has big plans for you and has made you specifically for someone else. Chase him and let that guy find you chasing God. You are right where you should be when he is your completer. So good. So good. <sighs> That's all I'm going to say. That's so good. Yeah, man. Good. good grief. I told y'all it was going to be good. fire up here with her today. I want to show you something real quick. If you'll give me about five more minutes since we started five minutes late. I know. Just give it to me because I'm telling you God's doing something really strategic. I want to show you what we're talking about today because here's what happens a lot of times in our lives is we start living our lives, right? And we have all these dreams and we have all these goals and we have all these visions and we have all this stuff that we want to accomplish, right? None of that's wrong. And so we're living our lives. We're kind of over here and we got these goals. Like I want to be CEO. I want to make this amount of money. I want the Range Rover, the 5,000 square foot house. I want the boat and I want all that stuff. I want the, and this is true for me, praise God. I want the 2019 Ford Raptor one day sitting in my my driveway. You know what I'm saying? Like you want those things, right? And you have those goals and you want to do that stuff. That's great. But then you meet somebody 
And you're like, oh, you are beautiful. You are amazing. All these things, right? And so then we decide to come together and we get married and, and we're living this life together, right? And so we're arm in arm and, and we're I doing and we're doing all this stuff and life is so good. But here's where most of us get it wrong is we never let go of our own personal agendas. And so we start chasing them still. We're like, oh, I'm going to climb the corporate ladder at my job, and I'm going to make this amount of money, and I'm going to buy this car, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to have this house, and I'm going to make this happen, and all this stuff. And we're chasing, and we're chasing, we're doing things that we, we've always had in our hearts to do. However, by the time we almost get there, we turn and we look, and we're so far apart from the one that we promised our life to, that we've promised our life to every dream that, wasn't, that we thought was accomplishable. And so we're, we're, we're distant and we're far apart and we don't have the connection, we don't have the covenant, we don't have the love or the commitment, but what if we just started over? What if there's a way to start it over and we still have our dreams and we, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have any of that. In fact, I think you should, but you come together. Let's come together up here so they can see us. And we come together and we're in this relationship. Will you hold this for me? And we take our dreams and when we say I do, we don't just say I do like, hey, I do, I want to be married, I want that diamond, I want that house. But we say, you know what, your dreams are now my dreams. Your gifting is now my gifting. Your heart is now my heart. And my pa your passion is now my passion. And so we tie the knot. We talk about it and we even go to the knot.com and we register our, our wedding there. But do we tie the knot or do we get caught up in the festivities? And here's the thing, like whenever we tie the knot, we got to wrap ourselves. Go ahead and do it because you, you got both hands free, right? We wrap ourselves around, and it draws us closer together. And so now we look and we go, you know, I had a long vision, and I had all these goals and these things that I could do over there, but now it just doubled in size because we can do more together than we could ever do apart. And now the, the knot is, I don't even know where the knot is because I don't need to know where the knot is because we're pulled tighter together because I don't need to be untying the knot whenever it gets hard. I need to be drawing closer together. When tension comes, it pulls me closer and it causes us to love each other harder. And we go, oh, you want to go back for that master's degree? Okay, let's go over here and make this financial sacrifice. Oh, you want to buy that? Let's do what we need to do to budget that because that's something you've always wanted. Oh, you want to be a part of that church and see these things happen in this community? Community. let's do this together why because we're in this together and we're not walking walking two separate visions we're not pulling further apart we're pulling what closer together and the knot is hidden because I'm not walking out of the escape door I don't need an escape plan I don't need a fire route I'm gonna make this thing happen because we're covenanted together yeah he got it wrong and he screwed it up yeah she's got it wrong and she screwed it up but you know what I love her and I covenanted my life to her I didn't just say I do and spend 14 billion dollars on a ceremony for no reason I did it to show people I'm serious about this thing and our visions are now tied together no matter what and here's what you'll find the more you chase vision together the more you love being closer to them in vision I don't know how to get this thing off and here's the thing listen somewhere on your chair around you every one of you should have a piece of yellow rope if you're single grab the rope if you're married grab the rope if you're with your spouse grab the rope together and here's what I want you to do if you're with your spouse I want you to take those two ropes and I want you to tie those two ropes together the best that you can and look at them and go, I've got this. I'm with you. We're going to tighten the knot because here's the thing. Many people can think that because we're pastors and because we lead this church, we don't go through the same struggles you do. We don't have the same temptations. People don't come against us the same way. We don't have the same attacks. I can promise you our schedule's just as busy. The temptations are just as prevalent. The attacks are just as fierce. All this stuff is happening but we've decided there is no escape door there is no knot to be untied we will only tie it together and love each other harder and draw closer together no matter what and so here's what I want to do and here's why I asked you to give me just a few more minutes today there's people in the room and couples to where you're going they're missing I'm missing something in my life maybe it's a major thing and you're about to quit maybe it's something that you just need help or maybe, listen, or maybe you just go, I just want to make sure my knot is strengthened. 
maybe you're single in the room today and you'll go, I need to pray over my future spouse. And I want you, if you're single, to grab two ropes because there's going to come a day whenever you get engaged in the night before your wedding, I want you to hand them that rope and look at them and go, two, five, ten years ago, whenever I, my pastor taught me about tightening the knot, I started praying for you and your purpose and your future and your vision. You didn't know it, but we're tying this thing together and we're doing it right. But here's what I want to do. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and, and, and trust me, listen, I know I've said this a couple times. We never go this long, but I just feel like the Lord's just wanting us to do something today. I just want to ask you to join with, I don't know, 50 couples that got up in the middle of the 10 o'clock experience, at the end of the 10 o'clock experience, and just say, I need your prayer. I need to tighten the knot, and I need to do what I need to do to get up out of my seat and make a symbolic step down to this altar for restoration, for promise, for redemption, for tightening the knot, for direction, and for guidance from the Holy Spirit. And Megan and I would love to pray over you for that. So if you're in the room, and you're a couple that's sitting there, and you need prayer in your life, maybe you're not about to walk out, but you need something. I just want to tell you to do something. Will you stand up out of your seat and join me at this altar right now? Come on. Don't wait on anybody else. This is you and this is them. If they won't get up with you, you drag them down here. Because God's doing something all over the room. Come on. Yeah, come on. Yeah, so good. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Now, if you're single in the room. And you're ready to start tightening the knot already, being who you need to be, chasing what you need to chase, giving your life to God so that you can be the, the person that you need to be when that time comes. Will you step up? Don't be ashamed of it. You step up out of your seat and come down to this altar and say, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to be who I need to be spiritually so that when I meet the one, I'll be the one. Come on, if that's you, let's go. Come on. Amen. Yeah, all over the room. Amen. Amen. I love this right here. Nothing else. Nothing else will do, Lord. I'm going to pray over you, but I just want you to begin to declare this, that nothing else, God, I need you. Megan and I are going to try to, to lay hands on every couple, but just pray. Just seek God right where you're at. Come on. Nothing else will God, I just pray right now. I pray redemption, God. I pray strength, God. I pray restoration, God. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen the knot, tighten the knot right now, God. Things are going to change in marriage, God. God, that, that, that you're going to begin to give vision and you're going to begin to give direction and leadership, guidance and knowledge, God. It's not about anything else but you, Father. I pray, God, that you'd begin to restore right now everything that they need in their marriage to be who you need them to be, who you want them to be, God, by the laying on of hands, by the power of the Holy Spirit rising up on the inside of them, God, that they would be everything, everything right now, God. I thank you for this couple right here to be an example, to say, I don't care. Nothing matters. It it doesn't matter how long we've been together. It doesn't matter how long we live this life. What matters is that we place everything on you. And we become who you want us to be, God. For every single in the room, God, that we begin to tighten our knot even before we have the other side of the string, God. It doesn't matter what's happening in this room. Lord, I pray that everything we walked in with, if it's not a you, God, it would melt away. It would melt away, God. I just believe that right now, Guys, I believe that here's what's been happening today. Keep praying. God is restoring the union of marriage back to a place to where it's a physical representation of his covenant with us. Come on, let's just declare that. Nothing else will do, Lord, because we just want you to be. And nothing else. Come on, worship with your spouse. Nothing else, Jesus, nothing else will do, Lord. We just want you. And nothing else, Lord, and nothing else. God, just sweep over this place. And nothing else will do. We just want you, Lord. We just want you, Jesus. To be the Lord of our lives. God, I believe that right now there's scars and there's, there's, there's hurts. There's open wounds in marriages around this altar right now that you're beginning to close up with miraculous healing. God, I pray that spouses would look at the other and say, 
I will not hold that against you and your past will not define us. We are moving forward and we're going to move forward with God and we're going to make this thing right. Nothing else, Lord, oh, and nothing else. Nothing else will do, Jesus. We just want God, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you were the one, the first covenant of commitment to us. And God, today we just declare that we will be kingdom relationships. We will be kingdom people. We will be kingdom couples that put you first as we subject ourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. That we would move forward with redemption and restoration, with love and joy. That we would be a living example of forgiveness. God, that every single in the room would begin to seek kingdom. Your Bible says that seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. And God, I just declare that the the blessing of marriage will come to us after we seek the kingdom first. God, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for who you are. And if you believe God's doing something amazing in marriages today, will you make a shout of praise in the room this morning? Come on, church.